So I'm Steve Croft, and it's a pleasure to be here with Norman Jarosik, who is the 2018, uh, one of the 2018 winners of the Breakthrough Prize in Physics. Uh, so you were working on the WMAP experiment, um, and I wondered if you could tell us what is WMAP and how did you get involved with it? Okay, well, WMAP is a satellite that measures the microwave background radiation, the light left over from about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And it gives us a picture of what the universe looked like back at that time. Um, and uh, I was one of the beginning, one of the original team members, where Lyman Page, Dave Wilkinson, and I, Wilkinson of Wilkinson and Satri Probe, had this idea for this satellite. And we were going around to various aerospace companies trying to get somebody who would actually help us build it in response to a NASA uh, announcement of opportunity. And uh, we eventually ran into the Chuck Bennett at Goddard Space Flight Center and teamed up with him. And is this, uh, did you dream of becoming a physicist when you were younger, or uh, did you have other plans? Um, I never took physics in high school, actually, but, but I was always very interested in physical sciences. My father was an electrical engineer, so he was always building stuff around the house, and you know, I was always taking things apart to figure out how they worked. So when I got into college, my first year, I took physics, and I just got totally hooked. I started working in the research lab as an undergraduate. So it's uh, pretty hands-on what, what you're doing? Uh, you yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes. I'm an experimental physicist, so I, you know, I just love having a challenge where I can build a piece of equipment. If there's a, a challenge, a measurement that's difficult to make, and you have the resources to do it, just putting together the right set of equipment to make that measurement. Can you take us through the main milestones of the program? Um, well, the first thing is we, we got together and we had to write the proposal, okay? Um, uh, the first proposal, we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the alternative designs. The design we finally used was, was basic, it was uh, a result of evolution, I would say, rather than revolutionary design. It was a thing that everybody in the field knew of a satellite very much like that was going to have to fly. And so we just worked out the details uh, very well for that, uh, that basic design. But how did you feel sort of seeing the, the oh, spacecraft oh, take yes, off? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, there were mixed feelings when the spacecraft took off because we'd been working on this for, you know, about, I'd been spending probably about six or seven years already on this project between proposal and actually building it. And I was a little bit terrified on launch day for two different reasons. Of course, here is six or seven years of your of effort which could explode on the launch pad if something went wrong with the launch vehicle. But on the other hand, you also realize that your part of the instrument could actually go wrong. And it's also a bit terrifying that you would cause a failure. But fortunately, it all worked out well for us. And so your part of the instrument, I understand, was the radiometer. Can you tell us yes. what is a radiometer and what were the challenges of building it? I mean, it, it is basically, uh, it measures the intensity of microwave radiations on the sky. If you think of an optical telescope, there's, an op there's lenses and mirrors that focus the light and then they go on to a, some sort of detector, like the detector in, in a camera. And what I worked is on the detector part, the thing that um, actually converts the, the signal into numbers that we can be turned into a map. Uh, Lyman Page worked on the optics, which is where basically they basically collected the light and focused it and sent it into the radiometer. And you said you were nervous that your part of the instrument might not work as expected. Yeah, Did yeah, it perform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, fortunately, actually, the, the satellite was originally designed to work for just two years, operate for two years. Uh, we had an extended mission and actually operated for nine. And by the end of the nine years, the instrument was working better on the last day than it was on the day we turned it on. And I know in the early phases, uh, one of the big risks was the instrument as opposed to the spacecraft. And basically, the, the spacecraft was getting old while the instrument was surviving very well at the end of the mission. And so when the res first results came in, were they different to what you expected? Um, no, actually, they were pretty much down... The the, what we did expect, the theorists had basically come up with this very detailed theory about what we should see. But there were these six unknown parameters they didn't know the exact values of, but they had some ranges. And they said, well, you know, if you make these measurements, um, if you can choose these six parameters properly, they should fit your results. And so we got the measurement, and sure enough, if we chose those six parameters properly, they could fit our results beautifully. And not only that, is the parameters fell right in the ranges of where they expected them. So they got very precise values of those parameters from our measurements. And uh, I was very impressed that theorists had gotten it right so far in advance. Were there any surprises? Uh, there are a few unusual things in the data, but we don't think there's any real f physical significance between them. But uh, we were a little bit worried, actually, that some of them could have been instrumental effects. But we had worked very hard to eliminate that. 
and we intentionally published our last paper before the follow-up satellite Planck flew, so there would be no bias. You know, and when Planck flew, they saw the same anomalies that we did, so it confirmed that the things that we had saw that we didn't really quite uh, expect were truly on the sky and weren't an instrument uh, artifact. So have we figured it all out now, or is there more to learn? Oh, no, there's much, much more to learn. I mean, the first generation satellite uh, was called COBE, and they made the first measurement of the anisotropy of the microwave background, meaning that it is different intensities in different directions. WMAP was the second generation satellite, okay, and we were basically 100 times more sensitive than COBE, and it could actually see much finer features. And since then, a third satellite run by the uh, European Union has launched called Planck, and it has improved on our measurements. Uh, and still, the, there are still measurements to be made, uh, something called the B modes, which will tell us about gravitational waves in the very early universe. And what are the sort of what are the implications if those are found? Um, that would be some more evidence supporting the theory of inflation, which I'm not an expert on. Uh, Dave Spurgle uh, would probably give you some very good discussion of that. But it would be evidence in support of inflation. So far, everything we have seen is consistent with inflation. Okay, but uh, we don't have very strong evidence for it at this point. But you're still excited about the field going forward? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The, te the technology for the detectors has been uh, advancing incredibly rapidly. Um, I mean, right now, we would not fly MAP again if it were around today. It would be so, so, so out of date. At the time, though, it was really state-of-the-art. And uh, the, nowadays, instead of using uh, the, the 20 detectors that MAP uses, uh, instruments are running thousands of detectors at once.